This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Are you sick of paying the man for electricity? Do you want to be energy independent and create your own power off grid? Well, this video probably won't help you with any of that, but I will show you how to make a cool little power plant. A few years ago, I did a couple videos on building compressed air turbines with 3D printed parts, and they actually generated some usable power, albeit very inefficiently. But then I got to thinking it'd be a lot cooler if I got one of these things to run off steam. So after I had dusted off my horrendous homemade CNC mill thing to use in a recent video, I was pretty confident I could also use it to make a turbine out of metal instead of printed plastic. Now in theory aluminum could work for this, but brass is similarly easy to machine, and I could braise copper fittings and tubings to it if I really needed to, so I got this 4x2 inch block of brass stock to make a turbine rotor and housing, and this 2x8 inch sheet to make the cover and other small details. I also wanted to try a somewhat different approach to generating steam, called a flash boiler. See, you Usually your boiler is one big tank that you have to spend a bunch of time heating up before the water starts to boil and you reach operating pressure. For a little model this is probably only a few minutes, but back in the day you'd have to start warming up the boiler in a big train at like 2 or 3 a.m. before running it in the morning. With a flash boiler, pressurized water is fed into a coil of tubing that's in direct contact with the flame or heat source, so the water coming in boils instantaneously. The obvious advantage is that you get steam almost immediately, but the catch is that you need to feed water at or above the pressure you intend to operate at. Typically this is done by a pump that's run off the engine and jump started by an external source, but I wanted to eliminate the moving parts of a pump, so I figured I'd just have a pressurized water tank that feeds the water through a flow restriction like a tiny pinhole or capillary tube in the flash boiler. Originally I'd intended to use a separate air tank with an output regulator to provide a constant pressure to the feed water, but then I realized that since I'd be using pro paint as fuel, I could just use that to pressurize the water since it's around 120 psi or 8 bar at room temperature. So the propane will actually be pulling double duty in this system. It'll be acting as a propellant for the feed water, but also providing the heat needed to boil it. So here's what the plumbing schematic looks like. It probably sounds crazy, but it actually worked really well. Oh, and then of course, once the steam is made, it's piped into the turbine, which gets it spinning. Now the turbine will consist of a housing, rotor, housing cover, and two little plates that hold the bearings in place. The shaft has a 2mm diameter, and it'll be connected to the turbine rotor through one of these shaft flange things I got on Amazon. The housing is a 2x2x1 two by two by inch block, since the raw material was in imperial dimensions, and has quarter inch inlet and outlet holes tangent to the rotor because the tubing I'll be using is also in imperial, however all other dimensions will be in metric. The inside diameter of the housing is 46 millimeters by 19 millimeters deep with these mounting holes for a bearing block that are 14 millimeters apart and will be tapped with an M3 thread. The rotor has a 45 millimeter diameter and it's 18 millimeters thick, so theoretically the clearances from the wall are 0.5 millimeters on all sides, which is pretty loose, but I suck at precision, so I'm using big tolerances. For the profile, there's six scoops with four millimeter radii. So the idea is to have the whole assembly mounted on some 20mm slot rail and connect it to a generator via a long shaft and coupler. The idea with the long shaft is that it serves as a heat break, so even if the turbine is running really hot, the generator should be at room temperature and the mount can just be 3D printed. Alright, let's start cutting the housing. I'm using a 1 8 or 3.17mm 2 flute end mill spinning at 12,000 RPM and traveling 8mm per second with a 0.2mm cut depth and 70% step over. That actually ran really smooth because brass is so friendly to machining, so I probably could go much further with my cut depth or my speed. So far so good. I haven't even needed oil yet. Brass is so much easier to cut than pure copper. Then I cut most of the bolt hole depth with a 1.5mm end mill. Whenever possible, I like to use an end mill to cut small holes rather than drilling them. If the end mill can't go deep enough, I then just finish them off on the drill press. Then I use the end mill going back and forth to get a really clean square cut off from the stock material. Then I flip it over and mill out a pocket for a tiny 2mm shaft bearing. The housing is turned on its side and the inlet and outlet holes are milled into it within 5mm of the housing center line. And here's the finished housing. I had one mistake where I forgot to raise the bit before I manually moved it after cutting the bolt holes, but it'll be covered up once the cap is on. It's certainly not perfect, but for a first attempt at machining brass on a 3D printed CNC router, I'm pretty happy with it. Then, using an 8th inch plate, I cut this cap to close up the housing once the rotor is inside it. Which brings us to machining the rotor itself. 
I started with the recesses for dropping the shaft adapter into, which had to be deep enough to accommodate the flange plus the height of the screw heads while being flush with the rotor face. Then I cut the outline with a single slot, which I've heard is really bad practice, but I got away with it. Now the outline was only milled down to the thickness of the rotor, which is 18 millimeters, but the stock is one inch, which is 25.4 millimeters. So what I'm gonna do is flip it over and just mill down the excess material until the rotor just falls out. Here's what it looked like when the end mill made contact with the slot cut, on the other side of the block. I guess the block wasn't perfectly level because I should be seeing the whole outline all at once when the last layer is milled down. So here's the finished turbine wheel and what's left of the brass block it was machined out of. Then I mounted the shaft adapter with a 2mm shaft installed inside it. This uses four M3 bolts screwed into tapped holes in the rotor. Here's what it looks like inside the housing. The wall clearances are really big, and I'm concerned about how much that'll hurt efficiency, but at least it's shiny, which is always important. As pretty and shiny as it is, it's imbalanced as hell, and I think that's because I lost my zero position partway through the cutting and had to manually re-zero, which inevitably had some error. Unfortunately, I had to butcher the rotor into a hideous mass of Swiss cheese until it was balanced, but after half an hour of tuning, I think I got it pretty even. Next, I needed to make the nozzle. Now, this is a whole science in and of itself, and ideally I should make it a converging-diverging nozzle just like a rocket to maximize the conversion of pressure energy to kinetic energy, but I'm not really confident in my ability to machine a nozzle like that in such a tiny scale, so I'm just going to stick with a regular old hole. This bit will be made from copper, which I milled from one of the ingots I melted in a previous video on copper production. It's literally just a tube with a 1mm orifice that's brazed into a standard quarter inch copper tube. Then I cut the cover plates that hold the shaft bearings in place and make a threaded hole on the inlet port for a set screw to mount the tube with the nozzle in it. And here's the full assembly of the turbine. The nozzle tube has a quarter inch flare nut on it to connect to quarter inch flare fitting so I can quickly hook it up to my little air compressor and do a test run. But before I see what this little spinny doodle can do, I want to tell you about this video's sponsor, Squarespace. Are you a businessy sort of person doing business type of things. I mean, like real business, not MLMs or crypto. Well, in that case, you're going to need a professional website and not one that's totally cringe. Whether you're manufacturing surface-to-air missiles or selling Sonic the Hedgehog fan art, the customer-facing end of your business needs to look good, and Squarespace is the perfect tool for the job. They provide all the tools you need to build and host a website. Sleek graphic design, media integration, payment processing, inventory management, appointment scheduling, traffic analytics, and even the ability to run ads on social media for your business. Squarespace has it all in one easy-to-use system that doesn't require any programming knowledge. Like seriously, the hundreds of hours you'd be spending on coding and graphic design could go to something more productive like making essential oils or developing an unhealthy obsession with hollow earth conspiracy theories. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and if you want to launch a website, go to squarespace.com slash hyperspacepirate to save 10% on your first purchase of a website or domain. Okay, let's spool up this turbine. Seems to run okay, but I dropped it while I was moving it, which caused the shaft to bend enough to cause those vibrations you hear. I can squeeze it until my fingers burn and it still keeps running, so it seems to have some power behind it, and this is just at 20 psi from the air compressor. I cut and drilled this bracket from a 3 quarter inch piece of aluminum L channel to mount the turbine to 20 millimeter slot rails and couple it to a little brush DC motor. At steady state, with 260 watts into the compressor, the output pressure is right around 20 psi with the little motor generating a measly 1.7 to 1.8 volts peak open circuit when measured on the oscilloscope. Now this isn't totally surprising because those generic little brushed motors normally run something like 6000 RPM at 3 volts of input, so conversely, if you spun it at 6000 an RPM, you should theoretically generate around 3 volts open circuit, which means that in this test I just showed, the turbine was only spinning somewhere between 3400 to 3600 RPM. Brushed motors are typically pretty inefficient at converting electrical to mechanical energy, usually around 40 to 50 percent depending on the load. Again, this theoretically means it'd probably be around 40 to 50 percent efficient at converting mechanical energy into electrical when it's running as a generator. Brushless motors, on the other hand, can be as high as 80 to 90 percent efficient or even more, and you can find ones with relatively low values of what's called KV, which refers to the RPM per volt you should get when the motor is unloaded.
I had this old brushless motor laying around which had a KV rating of 390, meaning it should theoretically spin at 390 RPM per volt of input or conversely generate one volt open circuit at 390 RPM. That means at the 3600 RPM we were seeing earlier, the motor should be generating around 9.2 volts without a load, although in reality it'll be less than this for reasons I'll explain in a minute. Okay, so let's see what this thing can do. Here's a look at the voltage between just two of the three phases when my air tank is discharged starting at 100 PSI. I don't know how much I trust my meter, so I looked at the voltage on the oscilloscope, about 7.3 volts peak. Now you may also notice that the frequency reads a little over 1 kilohertz, which would suggest we're running at 60,000 RPM, but that's definitely not the case. The AC frequency of a brushless motor running as a generator is the number of rotations per second multiplied by the number of poles. I don't recall off the top of my head, but I think this motor has either 18 or 20 poles, which means the actual rotation frequency is between 3200 to 3600 RPM. Now the test I just showed you is a voltage measurement between only two of the phases, so it looks like regular single phase alternating current but the output of a three-phase generator looks like this, with three sine waves that are 120 degrees out of phase with each other. So a regular old bridge rectifier won't work. We'll need a three-phase rectifier, which actually looks pretty similar to a bridge rectifier, but with a third pair of diodes. Incidentally, this circuit actually looks just like the driver circuit for a brushless DC motor controller, but the MOSFETs are replaced with diodes. Now the really nice thing about this type of rectifier is that even with zero smoothing capacitance whatsoever on the output, the waveform is actually somewhat smooth DC as opposed to the unfiltered output of a bridge rectifier from single phase AC which makes bumps that swing all the way down to zero volts. However, just like with a single phase rectifier, diode drop is going to account for a major loss of voltage because every time current through a phase is rectified, it drops by two times the forward voltage drop of the diode, which comes out to something like 1.2 to 1.4 volts, and when we're dealing with voltages between 5 to 10, that's a lot. So to minimize that loss, I made a rectifier with Schottky diodes, which only have a voltage drop of around 0.3, so the total drop will be around 0.6 across the rectifier. Now the rectifier board itself isn't much to look at, just six diodes and some connectors, but you can see on the scope how much nicer the output looks. To make it even cleaner, I threw this 220 microfarad capacitor in parallel with the output, and the bumps are totally eliminated, at least when it's unloaded. Let's see if it can handle a couple of LEDs. Yep, no problem. In my older videos on compressed air turbines, I measured output power with different loads to get a power curve, but it was a bit of a tedious task because I had to keep manually switching through several different resistors. For this project, I'm going to build a circuit that will allow me to sweep through a big range of resistances very quickly and instantly record voltage, current, and thereby power data. My quick and dirty solution to this was to wire a 2 ohm resistor in series with a MOSFET that has its gate voltage adjustable between 0 to 5 volts. When the gate voltage is 0, the circuit doesn't conduct duck, but when it's 5 volts, the MOSFET resistance is just a few milliohms, so basically negligible. However, in between those states, the MOSFET is in what's known as the linear region, where it acts like a variable resistor, where the resistance goes up as gate voltage is reduced. I can measure the high side of the resistor to see what voltage the generator is putting out, and if I measure the low side and look at the voltage difference, I can determine the current flow. Having both of these numbers, I can determine the output power. Now, a puny little TO220 MOSFET can't handle much more than one watt of heat on its own before it starts to get cooked, so to use it as a variable load resistor, I mounted it to a huge heat sink along with my 2 ohm load resistor, which keeps it at a safe temperature. It looks pretty silly, but it actually works really well. I'll use the analog inputs of an Arduino to measure and record the voltages. The analog inputs have a 5 volt maximum, so I use a 4 to 1 resistor divider to ensure I stay below that. In tests, I never went above 15 volts from the generator, so a 4 to 1 divider ensures a safe voltage level with a little bit of extra overhead. The Arduino is hooked up to a small laptop where I can read out voltage, current, and power on a serial terminal in real time and save all the data. Okay, so that's how the power measurements work. Now for the actual boiler. For a pressure tank, I'm going to use this big 2.5 inch copper pipe that I used in a previous video as a reservoir on my cryo cooler, but it was a bit too big for that application. To be honest, since this is going to be room temperature water, this really could have been done with PVC, but I already had the copper tank handy. The water is filled through this valve here with a funnel I've got connected to a hose that has a quarter inch flare adapter on it. Let's try hooking up a propane bottle. And as you can see, when I open the valve, a super thin straight jet of water is coming out. At 120 PSI, or 8 bar, I measured the flow rate to just a hair over 1 gram per second, meaning if it absorbs at least 2600 watts of heat, it'll boil as it's fed. To demonstrate simultaneous fuel feed and feed water pressurization from the same propane source, I hooked up this manifold between the tank and the propane bottle. 
So as before, we get the water jet, but I can also run this burner with no problems. For the flash boiler itself, I just coiled up a few feet of quarter inch copper tubing that will live inside the stainless steel pipe. When the high pressure stream of propane gas discharges from the capillary tube, it'll cause a venturi effect that draws air into the pipe and mixes with the propane to allow complete combustion. This is why the coil starts about a third of the way up the pipe, because the propane and air need a little bit of distance before they mix and combust. Alright, let's fire it up. I start the igniter torch before I open the fuel valve, and this is important, because if the pipe gets flooded with propane before ignition, it'll backfire hard enough to make you ruin your underwear. Then I open the feed water valve, and within a few seconds, I've got a steady flow of steam coming out. I started off with a 1mm diameter capillary to feed fuel, but apparently this was way too much because it was turning the pipe red hot, so I bumped it down to 0.6mm. Mind you, I'm not using any regulator to reduce the propane pressure, although in retrospect I probably should have. I was obviously using a ton of fuel because the little 1 pound propane bottle was frozen on the bottom after a couple of minutes. This also causes the propane pressure and thereby the feed water pressure to drop, which is one major drawback to using propane as a propellant for the water. Here I dropped to 60 psi in just a few minutes after starting at 120. For future runs, I'm going to connect the burner to a 15 pound propane tank since it has more thermal inertia. Of course, if I really wanted to boost performance, I could use a portion of the burner exhaust to heat the propane and drastically increase the pressure. However, this is a very dangerous game to play because as a saturated liquid, the propane's pressure will go up exponentially with temperature. For example, at 25C, the absolute pressure is 9.5 bar but at 60C it's 21 bar, and at 90C it's 38 bar. So pretty quickly you could have a huge explosion on your hands. Okay, so anyway, I hooked up a gauge to read the output pressure of the boiler and connected the turbine nozzle with some flare fittings and gave the turbine a spin. Seems to work all right, but I think a lot of heat is being lost between the burner and the nozzle, so I threw some glass wool insulation over the tubing to keep the heat in, and that seemed to help a lot. Let's see how long it takes to light up these LEDs from a cold start. Okay, that was about 12 seconds. If I used a boiler tank, it probably would have been at least 10 or 15 minutes. It looks cool as hell with the steam coming from the outlet, but judging by the widening cone, I'd say the majority of that pressure energy is being lost. I wired up this 5 volt buck converter to a USB-C connector. Let's see if it'll charge my phone. Yep, seems to handle charging without a problem. Now I'm going to hook up the variable load to my Arduino and laptop to record the output power. You can see the voltage tick up on the leftmost column as the turbine spools up. And then, as I expected, the voltage dips, but current and power go up as I reduce the resistance on the load. After 10 minutes of running with various loads at around 60 psi of steam pressure, I collected enough data points to create a power curve, and here's what it looked like. So at open circuit, we've got about a hair under 8 volts. Then as the load is increased, we hit a constant current of around 3 amps or so, until it kind of dies off below 1 volt because there's just too much load on the turbine and it just stops spinning. So now multiplying the current by voltage we get the power curve where we find that the power peaks at around 17 watts at 5.5 volts. Oh yeah, and here's a curve of the load resistance versus voltage on a separate y-axis where we can see that the peak efficiency load happens at around 1.9 ohms. So this is actually exactly how a power curve should look. At the max voltage you have no power because there's no load and therefore no current. But at zero volts there's no power because the turbine just isn't spinning, and somewhere in between you get the best efficiency. 17 watts isn't much, but it's enough to charge most small electronics, run some small lights, or a radio. So it might be useful in a pinch, although I don't think this would ever be my go-to power source. As for efficiency, I couldn't tell how much chemical energy was going in because I didn't have a big enough scale to weigh the propane tank before and after the runs. But I do know that about 1 gram per second of water was being fed in, and it takes roughly 2600 joules to boil off a gram of water starting from room temperature, so 2600 watts is getting absorbed by the boiler coil, which would make the turbine 0.65% efficient at its optimal load condition. However, there's a lot of heat being lost and not absorbed by the boiler, so in reality the efficiency is much lower than that. 
So yeah, that's pretty bleak. I think that's even less efficiency than one of those solid state thermoelectric generator things. I think a big cause of my inefficiency was just really loose machining tolerances between the turbine rotor and the wall and the fact that I didn't have a converging diverging nozzle to maximize conversion of pressure energy to kinetic energy of the steam. I mean, you can clearly see the exhaust steam fanning out at an angle, meaning that there was still a lot of expansion happening after leaving the turbine. At this point, I'd be tempted to think I'd actually be better off with a low speed reciprocating piston engine because with good piston seals and valve timing, most of the steam expansion can be harnessed. Assuming it had enough torque, it could just be connected to a generator with an overdrive gear to step up to a reasonable RPM. Alternatively, I might try one of those pseudo turbine things that uses sliding veins to keep compressed air confined. It's possible that those veins could survive steam temperatures depending on what material they're made from. I'm not sure. Anyway, that's my micro power plant. I've successfully converted fire into electricity, but it's got a long way to go before it's actually useful for something. Okay, bye. I'm gonna go do something else.